Well, thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, thank you to the sponsors as well. Um, so yeah, uh, I can click. That's not my slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. Too many buttons I need to press. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's better. Um, yeah, so my name's Nikki. I'm a technical manager at a company called FutureLearn. We're transforming access to education online. And before I was a technical manager, I've been a web developer for a long, long time, more than a decade, as Saren said. I don't want to tell you how, many, how much more. Um, but I'm definitely on the developer end of the sort of designer developer skill set. I've got an appreciation for design. I don't think you can work very long in this industry in front end without having that. But I'm not a designer, so I have to work really closely with designers to ship the products that we build. I can't do it on my own. So I've sort of developed this really keen interest in understanding and helping developers and designers work together more closely and effectively. So this talk is about one way of doing that. So today I want to talk to you about developers and designers who want to push their imaginations to the limit and push the web to its limits. And I'm going to talk about how one of our most used solutions, this grid fault sort of layout that we always fall back to, has served us really well for a really long time. But uh, the world has also moved on, and so can we. So this is what we're going to cover. Web design is getting boring. I always feel a bit like I'm putting myself out there when I say that. Um, it's a bold statement. And I always like to say as well, hashtag not all websites. The uh, JS Oxford website is really good, uh, really usable. I love the little timeline of the events that are happening today. Um, so we're just going to look at a bit of the history and a bit of the context to look back, to look forward. And then some final things that are, oh, the, uh, practical tips, of course, sorry, the reason you're all here. You <laughs> skipped over the middle bit. Uh, and then some, finally, some sort of uh, things that I stumbled upon when I was doing some of this work and things to look out for. So let's start by going back. Why even grids? What is the point of them? We've all been using grids and building them for uh, some time, online and offline. So why are they the go-to tool for sort of page layout? To answer that question, we need to go way back. This is the pyramid texts. Uh, it's dated to around 2300 BC, and it's the first example of human writing, of like human communication that I could find online. It still kind of blows my mind that uh, humans existed 3,000 years ago, and we were trying to communicate with each other when we wrote this stuff down, and I can find it on the internet and show it to you. Uh, we can see what they wrote, this is so cool. But I would like you to note, I think this is a one column layout. <laughs> okay, like a lot of columns, but you know, uh, it's all one long column. A few thousand years later, 568 AD, this is the Birmingham, Birmingham Quran manuscript. Again, like beautiful, stunning. I can't believe we have access to this kind of stuff. Still one column. This is page one, this is page two. Finally, 808 AD, we finally get. 3,000 years after sort of chipping away on those stone walls, we get to the two-column layer. <laughs> well done, humans. We got there in the end. <laughs> um, and I think the benefit that you can see immediately here is that there's a lot more information on this page. It's a lot more dense. Um, this is a medieval manuscript text, and you can see the benefit already. Um, this is the sort of marginalia that came a lot later than the original text of the book, and somebody's been able to sort of start relating, um, sort of arranging related concepts next to each other. Um, they can be separate, but they can still be connected to the main text that they refer to. In the early 20th century, the art movement exploded. The grid system itself was named. Uh, this is a book called Grid Systems in Graphic Design. And that movement sort of exploded and flourished. And this starts to look a lot more similar to the kind of modular component systems that we use today. Massimo Vignelli designed this Unigrid in 1970 something uh, for exactly that purpose, so that the output, the products that this grid was used to create, were more consistent, were easier to create and easier to reproduce and quicker. And this still helps the National Park cartographers today. They use the Unigrid to design the maps for the park, keep their layouts readable, make sure that one element is not overbalancing another. And this has a practical benefit as well. Looking at this, it just looks really good. Um, 
that's useful because it helps, it makes sure that people, when they're looking at the maps around the park, they're more likely to stay looking at the maps for a longer time and hopefully absorb more of the information. They need to stay safe and have a good time. It helps get their message across. But there are some bad examples of using grids too, like this. <laughs> So this tweet is from more than two years ago now. I don't think a huge amount has changed. Um, I'm really sorry to kind of keep bringing up this example because it is a little bit snarky, I know. And, but I think it just does show that you, know, you can take relying on this grid too far. This can be a problem. And I'm not knocking it. The reason we do this is because on many levels it works. It's modular, it's easy to reproduce. If you use the uni grid, it makes the maps really look really good and you know, make sure that you take that information and stay safe in the park but it's also really boring. You look at this and you can see the clues in the name. It's called the CSS box model. You can have the margin on the inside or the outside, but it makes boxes. You know, they're, they're all the same shape. Communication and design is this kind of human impulse. We've been trying to do it for 3,000 years. Uh, it has this kind of long and rich history, and I think it's a shame that we don't make more use of it. And then things like this. Yeah. No problem. Um, it's really good that you can go on Squarespace and get yourself a website now. Anyone can do that. Fantastic. But again, we're starting to lose the benefits of this kind of 3,000-year-old history of communication and design when everything starts looking so samey and sort of off the shelf. And you run the risk of not getting your message across as effectively as you could. So the only reason I'm really even giving this talk is that um, through like many conversations over many years with friends, designer friends and developer friends of mine at work, and they say, hey, we've got this box, we've made this layout, you know, what can you do to make it look a bit more interesting? And for the last 10 years, all I've been able to really say is, well, I could put rounded corners on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very satisfying. Nobody's really pleased with that answer. And the only reason we even have the ability to put images and um, use CSS in browsers is because designers got frustrated and they wanted to add colour and they wanted to use layout and use fonts and not be restricted. It doesn't have to be just rounded corners. Let's think a bit bigger. So I'm not the only one who thinks this. This is Jen Simmons. She's amazing. She's like one of my heroes. Uh, she said this during a video discussion at Ballista Park last year. She's one of the people who's doing really amazing work in kind of improving graphic design on the web and improving typographical design on the web. She does, she's a designer and developer advocate at Mozilla and a member of the CSS working group. And she's really pushing this idea, um, not just by doing talks and by sort of telling people about it, but actually working with the people who are kind of implementing this stuff to make the web better. And then she said this, we're copying each other's work too much. Too many things look like medium. Too many things look like web design out of 2007. <laughs> Oh, that's 10 years ago. <laughs> Too many things look like copies of each other. Everybody's bored. So there is a way to make design better on the web. It's that way, apparently. <laughs> so once I started thinking about this, it was in my mind, I just started seeing it everywhere. Uh, these are examples of graphic designers sort of pushing the boundaries of their layouts. And you can do really interesting things, like this kind of um, the line of text following the dress this really striking art direction that kind of really draws you in and makes you want to read the article. I know we don't need enough of that with like clickbait headlines and stuff, but you know, I think this is much nicer. These were all from the same issue of one magazine. Somebody there really likes this style. Um, <laughs> but the point of all these examples is that like print can do this, and for decades we've been saying you know the web is not print, and that's true. It isn't. Uh, we shouldn't try and make things all exactly the same. But if we have the technological ability now to do it in a sort of inclusive, accessible, practical, scalable way, then I think that we should be taking advantage of that. So if we did want to do something a bit more interesting like this, and we didn't have CSS shapes, how could we do it? How have we done it in the past? Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You could go super old school, just bung all the text in an image. I'm sure you know all the reasons why this is a terrible idea. Um, I think that a lot of web comics are still published like this, uh, which I think is a real opportunity for somebody out there, a really interesting industry that would really benefit. It would be really great if someone came along and sort of gave publishers more options for doing this kind of stuff and make them available to a much wider audience. If you didn't want to put all your text in just one image, you could have every line of text kind of positioned you know, manually with spans and paragraphs uh, with JavaScript. It's still not 
particularly maintainable or scalable or accessible, maybe performant. There's probably lots of other ways that you can think of as well that aren't great. So that's kind of where we're at before CSS shapes, like the kind of current state of the art. I think you can tell where I'm going with this. <coughs> Let's get away from these boring rectangles. We're stuck in our old ways, we're stuck on these grids, but actually there's something that can make things a lot more interesting for us and a lot better. Um, grids are great for all those reasons, like legibility, white balance, space, you don't have to lose any of that. But once you understand those rules and you've put the time in to learn how and why they work and you have the foundations and you know why it's like this, then you can break the rules, so you can break out of the grid. And there is a way to do that. Hooray! <laughs> So we're on to the practical tips section. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is shape outside. Uh, shape outside applied to an element makes the text flow around that element in the shape that you've chosen, hopefully quite obviously named. We're going to get into some examples in a minute. The caveat on this at the moment, the shape, the element your shape floating around must be shape. Uh, the element must have must be floated. Sorry. <clears throat> Apparently, I just found out today that might change. They may be like fixing that up in the spec. Don't know when. Random rumours and gossip. Um, and the element must also have shape, uh, height and width, so it must have layout. So we're just going to be covering the top three values today. I couldn't. I had to sort of play around with it, and I couldn't do anything with inset that you can't already do with floats. So I don't think that's particularly interesting. If you want to have a go and have a play, then you should. An ellipse, I think, is like a type of circle. I told you I wasn't a designer. I, um, I got some raised eyebrows with my when I was doing this uh, work with a run through of my designer sort of colleague, but I'm uh, sticking to it. Um, so let's have a look at shape outside circle. Hopefully, this is unsurprising to you, but it aligns text around a circle. These properties are all very wrong seal. They do what they say on the tin. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is a very simple example. If you want to have this kind of red dot layout, you can do it however you like. And then you just have this kind of one liner to get the things aligning around the, the, the shape. It's really nice, really simple, really easy. And if shape outside is not supported, you just get your standard sort of rectangle boxy text that you always had before. You haven't impacted your accessibility or your readability. That's circles, easy, right? <laughs> Polygons. So the simplest example of a polygon is a triangle. This is what it looks like. Again, this is like really simple examples. You can set this up however you like. I've done it like this. And you just have this one liner again to add the shape to the property to kind of get this nice alignment. Um, but you can see that this is like a little bit more complicated. You actually have to plot your points now. We can't just say, oh, it's a circle or it's a square, I guess, if it was inset or whatever. It's getting a little bit more complicated. Again, if it's not supported, it doesn't matter, it just falls back. Great, easy. Another example of a polygon. This has um, got the corner cut off. And again, you can see when I'm starting to make this shape, I've had to sort of plot an extra point to kind of figure out like, where I want the text to kind of go. So it's starting to look a little bit more complicated now, like, oh, I've got to keep all these numbers in my head. If I want a more complicated shape than a square with a corner cut off, like, what do I do? Mm. I guess worse, right? Um, so I didn't have the space to put all of the points on, but it like basically goes like over the other side of the room. Um, polygons can have infinite points, I think. Uh, so it starts to look a bit more scary, and it starts to look like a bit of a pain in the ass and a bit of uh, a barrier to entry. Like if I have to do all this work, um, I might not be bothered. Like how can I convince my designer colleagues to help me with this? So we're very lucky that a whole bunch of people have done a whole bunch of good work to make this a lot easier. And there are some tools to help us make these shapes. So I have a video. I don't have any sound for this. Hopefully this is OK. Um, this is Firefox Nightly, but this tool has just landed in Firefox, I think. So everybody has access to this now. So I've got my dev tools open. Uh, and I'm going to go and select the element that has the <coughs> shape applied to it, which is the cat. And then when I do that, I'm sorry it's so small, um, you start getting these kind of rules out here. And there's a tiny little button next to the shape outside. And if I click on it, I can see the points that I've got. Which is like, oh my god, this blew my mind when I first saw it. Like, look, mom, I'm a designer. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so the lovely thing about this is that everything updates in real time here. So once you've kind of sat and played about with it and made it how you want, you can just copy those over and straight into your code. Um, 
these tools also are not just for shape outside. I think there's like a grid editor in there as well if you want to do CSS grid. Um, and I think, yeah, this is just from Firefox. So yeah, go and have a play with that because it's amazing. The power of the browser now is just phenomenal. Uh, if you don't have Firefox, there's an editor for Chrome as well. It works in a very similar way. Um, I don't know if this one has grid. I think it might be just shapes. Uh, but yeah, it does kind of the same sort of thing and you can kind of pick your points up and move them around. So that's it for CSS shape polygon, shape outside polygons. But I found when I was doing this and sort of playing and making up some examples, even with these tools, um, I was still finding that's like a little bit of extra work that sometimes I don't know if I can really be bothered to do. So there's one last value I wanted to tell you about with shape outside, which again, like completely blew my mind when I found out that it was just the cleverest thing I've ever seen. Um, and that is the URL value. So this is a kind of similar layout to the one we had before with the cat. Um, same effect as before, but way less code. This time we're not going to set all of our points out directly or play in the browser with it or anything like that. But we're still going to get this. Oh no, did I double click? But we're still going to get the same effect. Ah, the magic is ruined. Uh, you use a transparent image and it picks up on the alpha channel. So you need a transparent PNG or a transparent SVG. It also works with both of those. Um, and you just pop your URL to your image in there. And there's this new property, the shape image threshold. Uh, so 0.5 there means all the pixels that are more than 50% transparent are the ones that it will kind of pick up on and throw around. So I found this and I was like, brilliant. This is a way more common use case, I think, in my experience anyway, that you'll be aligning text around an image rather than a, just a random shape. So you may as well have the browser do all the work for you. I think I'm very lazy. I don't know if this is coming across. Yeah. Um, especially because you've already had to do the work to like prepare the image, right? Somebody's had to go and uh, transparent out the bits they don't want or what have you. So you've already done that work. You may as well use it rather than duplicate it all in your points. Um, so that's all about shape outside. Let's have a look at browser support. How real is this? Like, when can I actually use it? So, okay. It's not too bad. Uh, just coming in Firefox, which is great. I'm very excited about that. Edge under consideration. Good. Okay. Um, oh, never going to be an IE. Okay. Well, <laughs> like over time, that's not going to become less of a problem. Um, so, yeah, it's not supported in all the browsers. So, we do have to be a little bit careful about how we're using it and sort of think about our progressive enhancement and our, sort of consider our fallbacks. I say only, you know, consider the fallbacks. The great thing about this is that this is fine, you know. Um, it's a one-liner. It doesn't impact your performance to add it. It looks really good. If you don't have it, it still looks really good. This is the sort of thing to watch out for, just kind of thinking through um, all the cases and what might happen if things aren't supported. So that's it for CSS Shapes. We have some friends who also want to come and play. CSS Clipping. So you might be familiar with some of this. Uh, it works, I think, the kind of same way that it does in like Photoshop or Sketch or one of those editors, using a path to draw a shape, and then the things inside the path are visible and the things outside aren't. Let's look at some examples. Um, before we go on to those, the syntax is exactly the same as CSS shapes. I love that they've done this. I think this is really clever. Lowers the bar barrier to entry again. Um, these names, these shapes, are called the basic shapes. Uh, in the sort of geometry spec of uh, browsers. Slightly confusing, CSS shapes, basic shapes, but you know, once you've got your head around it, it's great, you can just use them for everything. Uh, very helpful. So this is the kind of thing that you can do. Uh, and again, like I did this in the browser tools, I was just kind of playing and dragging things around. Um, <coughs> worth noting before we dive in, I think, as well, um, the uh, clip path works on SVGs as well as HTML elements, so I'm just using it on an image here or on any other element you could do. Um, but they do work on SVG as well. So I'm sure you can imagine the kind of things that you could do with this, all kinds of you know, different shapes. This is really simple again, and you don't have to prepare your images, you just do it all in the browser. A lot of times when I've been doing this kind of thing with designers, it's been like quite a round trip and a lot of back and forth. Like, they make an image, and then I upload it, and then we look at it, and it's not quite right, and then they say, okay, well, give me another image, and then I upload it, and then we look, it's still not quite right. So, um, but with this, you just like sit and play with the points in the browser, and it's just so much quicker, giving designers a lot more control over the sort of end result. I think a lot quicker as well. Um, 
So this is a real world example of Clippath. This is the website that I work for, FutureLearn. Um, this is what the amazing learner growth team used to build a new module for the homepage, which is that top kind of banner aspect. And they wanted the uh, steps, we call them, the future length steps, to kind of wiggle down between those images, sometimes also reflected on our branding, although not apparently on this slide. Um, <laughs> so that's nice, we like that. Um, this is how it looks on mobile. Um, all of this stuff, like CSS clip path and also CSS shapes, uses any CSS unit, so it can be responsive. I think they use calc and um, percentages to make this work. REMS, EMS, whatever you like, whatever works for your sort of situation. And again, it's a one-liner. You have to kind of work out your points, and we have this sort of slightly complicated design, so we did that, and we were happy to do that. I think we did a mock-up in like CodePen or something to kind of prove the concept. But because we did the shape in the code, we didn't have to go back and forth with the images constantly. It's quite a nice time saver. And again, we were quite happy with this fallback of just the straight line, so this is like edge, something that it doesn't have. So that's clip path on HTML elements. I'm sure you're going to see more of this later, but it gets really exciting when you start putting SVG into the mix with clip path because um, SVG is just XML, right? So you can put text nodes in it. You can start doing stuff like this. That's the image behind um, the text. I just think this is very exciting. I'd love to see people kind of doing more kind of interesting layouts and interesting headers and interesting text with this kind of stuff. Um, because it's SVG as well, you could have multiple nodes inside, so you could have um, you know multiple kind of windows onto one image. I sort of had this idea that you that might be quite performant if you had like a big image with different windows on it into different areas. I'm not entirely sure if that would work, but it sounds like a good idea. Um, let's look at browser support for ClickPath. A lot better. This is good. Um, worth noting again. This is for HTML. Uh, ClickPath on SVG works pretty much anywhere that SVG is supported, so pretty much everywhere. But again, you know, looking through your fallbacks, making sure that your progressive enhancement is, you know, you've thought about all the cases. Uh, so that's it for practical tips. There's a few final thoughts that I had while I was working on this stuff, and while the team were working on the homepage module, things that I think are just important takeaways to kind of remember. So the first thing I think is really important is that all of this stuff, not just CSS shapes and clip path, but like anything that you're using that isn't supported everywhere, like it's not all or nothing. Just because some of this stuff is not supported in every browser, it doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means that you can be a bit cleverer about how you design it and how, how we build it. And there's a nice tool that can help us do this. So what do you do if you've made a really nice design, but it's a little bit more complicated than this? These are really simple examples on purpose to sort of help build up our understanding um, <coughs> of how these things work. And I, yeah, I did that on purpose. <coughs> Triangles and circ circ circles, yeah, they look really good. But actually, you know, in my team, in my production website, uh, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, so going back to the example that I showed you earlier, this is what we wanted to build, and we were quite happy with this fallback. When I showed you this example before, actually, I was, again, simplifying it. Um, there's something wrong with this picture, uh, very subtly wrong, but we were not happy with this fallback as it stands. Uh, <laughs> if, you, um, if you look at it in the browser or you have the eye for it, you can see that it's not perfectly symmetrical. And this is a problem. We weren't actually happy with this the first time that we did it. So we added some margin so that they do actually line up. Great. But now, we don't want the margin if the clip path is applied. Oh, like, I'm starting to get really confused. Mm. It's okay. We can get back to this. We just reset the margin inside a feature query. So there's a new thing, you might have heard about it, the supports keyword. We say if clip path is supported, then we take away that margin that we added for when it isn't supported. And again, like, it's really simple. It's like two lines. Um, it works a lot like the media query. Syntax is very sim similar. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate as well, after saying all of that, you don't have to do this. Um, if you're happy with a sort of slightly unsymmetrical fallback, then that's completely fine. If you need to do some shenanigans and resetting and overriding, then you can just include those in that supports block, and yeah, that's fine too, your fallback won't be affected. The important thing to note here is that, yeah, in all those other examples, the circle, the triangle, it was fine, we don't have to do it, it just defaults back to a rectangle. 
supports keyword is for more when you're in a slightly more like complicated real life situation and you want to finesse the detail. You only have to use supports if the natural fallback you know is something you're not happy with. So next up, building on that I suppose is to say like this can be a bold statement and a bold layout and something like you're thinking really big or it can just be a really small enhancement. But the important thing to remember with all of these things is to remember those kind of inclusive design patterns. So this is from a real website, an example in the world, and one thing I wanted to highlight here is that all of the sort of real world examples that I've seen have the ragged edge of the text on the right hand side and not the left. And that's really important in left to right languages. Reading from ragged edges on the sort of starting end of the line is really difficult. Your eye can't like sort of go back to the line and find it even more difficult if you have dyslexia or anything else that sort of makes it harder for you to read, but it's, it's difficult for anybody, so don't do that. <laughs> the final thing I wanted to say was this kind of, yeah, use it or lose it, I guess. Um, this looks a bit dry, and it is. This is the spec for CSS shapes. I'm not really recommending that you like go and read it, um, but I think it is kind of important to keep an eye on stuff like this. I guess that's why we're all here tonight. Um, follow Jen Simmons, follow Rachel Andrews, who's also writing about CSS Grid and other shape stuff at the moment. Follow pe other people who are writing about this kind of stuff. Because if we don't use it, the browser implementers will just think that we don't want it and they'll take it away. You know, that's actually happened with uh, CSS Shape Inside. Um, it, nobody used it, it's slightly more complicated than they kind of expected it to be. It's gone away until we say that, you know, actually we do really want this. They do look to us for feedback and we should let them know what we want. Lastly, some other ideas, if uh, this has inspired you and you want to find out more about CSS shapes or any of these other things, these are some other sort of interesting typographical design tweaks that are coming to the web hopefully soon. I've linked everything up here, so I'll put the slides up later and you can just click through. So that's kind of it really. Uh, mainly I just wanted to, be, to ask you to be inspired, go away, make stuff, tell me about how you're getting on. I'm really interested in your shapes, what you make and some more people for inspiration. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>